Good morning. Good afternoon. Good morning, Europe. Good afternoon in Asia, Japan, where my dear friend and colleague Akiko Fukunu, the chair of the Umaka World Committee, is here with us to present the second nominee of the Umaka Award this year. And what a nominee. Great project, isn't it, Akino? Akiko? Excellent. Great. Very wonderful. Will you present the... Okay, no, sorry. Let's... Well, how do you want to do this? <laughs> Funny. It was my cue. I wanted to be shorter, but anyway. Uh, okay. <laughs> <sighs> Sorry. No, it's okay. This happens. Look, Sorry. I will cut this part. Let's okay, start. okay. okay. <laughs> <laughs> I think you should sure. leave it in. <laughs> I could, we could leave it in, yeah, it's true. I think you'll need to humanize everything at the moment. In <laughs> it does, it does. Maybe. Sorry. Yeah. Sorry. We'll okay, get there. We'll get there. Will you introduce... Akiko, will you reintroduce our guests today? Of course, of course. Thank you, Marta. Um, good evening and good uh, morning to you all. Um, it is my pleasure to be here with the team from Manchester Museum, um, from um, University of Manchester. They have a great and a very meaningful project that they will be sharing with us today. Um, the title of their project is Return of Cultural Heritage Project, Manchester Museum Repatriation. Um, we have a team of presenters today, and I would like to um, pass the stage um, to Esme and um, Eric and George. Um, so um, could you first introduce yourselves and then start your presentation? Thank you. Brilliant. Well, hello, everybody, and um, uh, we're really delighted to be here. My name is uh, Esme Ward, and I'm director of Manchester Museum, and I'm joined by Erit Narkis, a uh, conservator at the museum, and George Young, our head of collections and exhibitions. Um, we had hoped that Mangu Badajari Yana, a Ganga leader traditional owner, would be um, with us today. Uh, sadly, the time difference has meant this isn't possible. Uh, however, he and Donald Bob, a senior Garawa lawman, uh, who you will see later in the presentation, have sent their best wishes and kindly allowed us to share an extract um, uh, of film from the handover ceremony, which we'll do shortly. Um, so, uh, I'm going to talk about our project. Um, following extensive partnership work with the Australian Institute of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islanders, called AAPSIS, uh, Manchester Museum announced on the 4th of October 2019 that it would unconditionally return 43 secret, sacred and ceremonial items from its collection to four Aboriginal communities. It became the first university museum in the world to do so and established a new precedent for repatriation among heightened international debate around colonisation. Uh, the repatriation contributes to the wider ambition of the AAPSIS Return of Cultural Heritage Project, namely the return of Indigenous cultural heritage to Australia for the purpose of cultural revitalisation. We're, we're going to play an extract um, from Mangu's speech at the handover ceremony. Um, the sound's a little bit muted at the beginning and it does get better. Um, the ceremony took place at Australia House in November and we wanted to foreground our presentation um, really with Mangu's words so you could hear about the impact and significance of this work. So hoping the technology works. Can anyone hear it? George, we can't hear. <coughs> so we have a bit of a technical hiccup. Uh, we'll we'll try again. Mm. 
Okay. Is it not working, George? Does it not want to do it? Okay. Is it worth trying again or shall I move on? Here we go. is a fundamental part of the healing and reconciliation process, both within our communities and between our modern and colonial states. Bringing these sacred cultural heritage items back to the country where they belong is important and necessary for the purpose of cultural revitalization, because what deep within these items and artifacts is our law, our histories, our traditions, our livelihood, and our stories. Article 12 of the United Nations Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples states that Indigenous peoples have the right to manifest, practice, develop, and teach their spiritual and religious traditions, customs, and ceremonies, the right to maintain, protect, and have access to privacy to their religious and cultural sites, the right to the use and control of their ceremonial objects, and the right to the repatriation of their human ancestral remains. We can keep our culture and our traditions alive and strong if we don't have access to the tools and items that allow us to practice, preserve, and develop these ancient and sacred customs. These cultural heritage items and artifacts here and all around the world must return back to the country where they belong because like us, they are off the land. They weren't made in some warehouse in China or in a factory in London. They came from the land, our land, our home. They give my people hope, life, meaning, sustenance, and the future. As with all social movements towards change and progress, this is but the first step, a stepping stone in the right direction towards a better and more inclusive future. We share a dark history, but it's moments like this when we come together as one, united by our shared desire to do better, to be better, and to right the wrongs of the past, that we start to heal the spiritual wounds and the intergenerational trauma that still exists today. As a young Aboriginal person and as a proud Bangalore man, this is to me and my community what true practical reconciliation looks like. It's not just flowery rhetoric or incremental or tokenistic change. This is real and substantial change, and it has become a reality because of the courage and conviction of people like Craig. Chris and Tamara and the entire team at Access, in partnership with people like Professor Thacker, Esme and Stephen, and all the uh, wider community of Manchester University and Manchester Museum. The unconditional return back to country of these sacred cultural heritage materials will have a profound positive impact on the practice, preservation, and development of my people's culture, language, and traditions for generations to come. As a proud descendant of the oldest continuing culture in human history, and as some of these people have walked across this land since the very first sunrise, I am honored to have the opportunity to carry on the work of my ancestors by bringing our sacred cultural heritage items and artifacts back to the country where they belong. So on behalf of my peoples, the Dunwida and Dunwida peoples, we thank you for your willingness to embrace the tide of change and open up a new chapter in the history of reconciliation between our two nations and all its peoples. As the late great honorable Nyabekan once said, we have been the dreamers, we have been the sufferers, now we are the builders. So let us continue to work together to build a better future for all our peoples, indigenous and non-indigenous alike. Be kind, be well, and be one with each other. Thank you. Um, as you may have sensed, it was a deeply moving uh, ceremony. Um, uh, the, there will be a transcription of the video um, uh, available um, uh, in the video description. Um, I'm, I'm, I'm actually, I want to give a little bit of wider context um, to the project. Um, and uh, to do that, I think we'll just move to a bit of a PowerPoint presentation that will accompany uh, some of the uh, reflections we're going to share. 
hopefully. Okay. So I'm going to get started and hope that the PowerPoint catches up with me. Um, so the return of cultural heritage projects was um, initiated by AATSIS and originally funded by the Australian government to mark the 250th anniversary of Cook's first voyage to the east coast of Australia. Um, the project scopes and facilitates return of cultural heritage from overseas collections back to country. Um, it involves secondary source research of institutional holdings, uh, followed by investigation of online collections and, of course, direct contact. Um, in Manchester, to give some context, we have 30,000 objects from Australia um, at the Manchester Museum. And from the very first contact with AAPSIS right the way through to board approval took 18 months, um, uh, which for museums is, is very fast. Um, uh, we prioritized the work and that was 18 months of collaboration, provenance research and critically relationship building. Um, our registrar, Gillian Smithson, sadly can't be with us today, but her reflections and words um, we wanted to share, and they're going to be read by George Young, our Head of Exhibitions and Collections. So over to you, George. Thank you. So, in Gillian's words, in my everyday work as a registrar, I'm concerned with the well-being and whereabouts of museum collections. When other organisations borrow things and they go off site, I ensure contracts are in place to agree conditions of loan, that suitable transport's arranged. I know who's looking after them and when they'll be back and that, when, that they will return to the museum safe and sound. These principles rely on the assumption that things rightfully belong to the museum, that they were given or sold freely and that the loan or transfer of objects come with conditions dictated by the museum. Through the process, I have the privilege of speaking directly with elders from Aboriginal communities who explained why the objects needed to return home, that they have life force that needs to recover and be nurtured back to full strength. I started to really get the sense of the long, long struggle of communities asking and being unheard and patronised. Something I knew in my mind but these long conversations around the phone alongside my colleagues allowed me to feel it in my heart and to know that we were with one purpose committed to this repatriation and that we would do everything within our power to make it happen. In order to play my part in returning these objects home from where they were taken without permission, I did have to face my own inherited privilege and misunderstandings. It sometimes took me by surprise. To make change, one has to move through resistance. Not only other people's, but one's own conditions belief, conditioned beliefs and habitual thinking. The work we love of protecting and caring for collections, if not checked and challenged, can perpetuate a domineering, bullying attitude. I hope to help communicate and encourage a fearlessness in facing up to where we are, what we have, examine how it got here and how to respond. Um, and on screen, you'll see a picture of Gillian uh, with Mangu um, and my colleague Irit Narkis, who's a conservator, will now pick up the point at which the delegation was on site with us at Manchester Museum. Thank you, George. So actually, before they arrived, uh, we had to make some preparation. One important one was that all the objects we were repatriating are restricted to men and all our conservators are women. Our registrar is a woman and Gillian and our curatorial assistant Susan Martin is also a woman so we had to find a male conservator we did we found one in the um, university library Mark Furnest who did an admirable job um, so that was step one which kind of makes you think I suppose um, <clears throat> then the obvious preparations of having somewhere to convene and food and drink, but really it was to make them all feel comfortable and welcome and really reassure them that we are facilitating the process, but they're, they're in charge, it's, it's, it's their show. Um, 
And it's a strange position for a museum professional to be in, and for a conservator, certainly, this, this kind of, <gasps> nobody else touched these objects, uh, but you really have to let go. It's humbling. Um, so we have to, for example, allow them to be in the stores on their own without a member of staff, uh, and also stand back and not interfere when they made decisions about the objects and how they would be used and transported, which is actually hard. We all have to catch ourselves. Um, but it was really, it was such a moving experience and emotionally very moving and it really makes you realize, but there's also, the, the moving is also the shifting in attitude because that's what it brings about. And thinking differently about how we do our work and what Gillian's words were saying about the rights that we think we have to the objects and, and kind of reviewing that. And I think once we've gone through that process, I think and I hope there's no going back. It's, it's just a switch. It's a new way of working. I think that's really important. Um, so we did the first repatriation in November and it was very good and very moving. The second part was supposed to happen in March. Now we all know what happened in March. So obviously all the ceremonies, all the visit of the delegation, that was all canceled. And, but we were very determined to get those objects back to country where they belong because everybody had worked so hard for that to happen. Um, and we were really honored that they actually trusted us enough and I think that attests to the relationship we managed to build with IATSIS and uh, with the people and country, that they allowed us to pack and ship the objects without them being present. Um, that's it, I'll pass back to Esme now. Brilliant, thanks Eric. Um, from, from the very uh, first moment really, we decided that we wanted to be as transparent about the process as was possible. Um, uh, we live broadcast uh, a talk led by AXIS that you see here um, uh, in Manchester, which was focused on the methodology. Um, and of course, the handover ceremony was broadcast <coughs> as well at Australia House. Um, and they've received thousands of views all, all over the world. Um, indeed, there was widespread international and national press and media interest. Um, I felt compelled to write an open letter, which I have never done before, um, entitled The Tide of Change, um, published in Museum ID and, and shared really widely, particularly on social media. In it, uh, I reflected on the challenge um, and crisis uh, facing universal museums, um, how the debate around repatriation <clears throat> tends to be focused on what we lose rather, uh, and, and in, in so doing, um, we really miss what is gained, um, new understanding and relationships. And, and finally, how the experience for us was really shaping a new ethics of care uh, at Manchester Museum, extending that uh, stewardship and that care beyond collections to people, ideas, and relationships. And um, the University of Manchester shared the open letter um, with staff and students um, as an embodiment of its commitment to social responsibility and global citizenship. Um, and that really brings us up to where we are now and facing the future. So I'm going to hand to George just to uh, finish off. Thanks, George. Thanks. So the unconditional returns from Manchester Museum facilitated through IATSIS and the Return of Cultural Heritage projects. Uh, they were in many senses innovative, but they were also a continuation. A continuation of work stretching back a generation. Uh, Manchester Museum first returned human remains to country in 2003 and the more recent Return of Cultural Heritage project has shown the power of unconditionally acknowledging that Aboriginal peoples have the primary right to ownership and control of all forms of their heritage, regardless of where that material is located throughout the world. It's also a continuation of the work of cultural revitalisation and empowerment driven by Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander leaders. 
there will be a positive impact upon the practice, presentation and development of culture, language and traditions of the Aranda, Gangli Dagarawa, Niamal and Yaruru peoples for years to come. Returning cultural heritage material supports intergenerational transference of knowledge and begins to dismantle colonial curatorial practices that continue to inflict loss and trauma. And this is a, an image from the handover ceremony. And this is an image um, from the return to country, um, which we'd like to finish on. So the image on screen shows Gangalida dancers celebrating the on-country return event. We also very much continue, consider the repatriations of this past year as a beginning, a beginning of a new level of partnership and reciprocity. The way this repatriation was undertaken was anything but transactional. Both the museum and the traditional custodians and owners gained. Manchester Museum has signed a memorandum of understanding with AXIS to work together over five years on a two-way process of cultural enrichment. It's also the beginning of our museum and our university being moved by these repatriations. A new indigenizing Manchester Museum pro programme with a dedicated curator of indigenous perspectives is about to launch this autumn with the support of the John Elliman Foundation. And we've also got a new international research partnership between the universities of Melbourne and Manchester, led by Dr. Megan Tinsley, which will explore the lessons rep repatriation carries for institutions engaged in the project of decolonization and indigenization. So it's lastly, both a continuation and a beginning of a global shift in thinking and practice. The recent increase in repatriation discourse has been marked um, and the 2018 Sarsavoy report on the restitution of African cultural heritage this particular moment. Manchester Museum and IAPSIS have made a critical and timely contribution by demonstrating what can be done and widely publishing information about our collaboration in support of further action. Just last Friday, IAPSIS published its report on the return of cultural heritage project 2018 to 2020. Um, I do recommend everyone reads, reads it. Um, and the Manchester Museum repatriations will also form a case study within the upcoming guidance for museums on the restitution and repatriation of cultural objects that's been commissioned by Arts Council England and undertaken by Professor Janet Ulf at the Institute for Art and Law. So what we feel we've done is taken a ground shifting step, a step that we as a university museum were uniquely placed to take. Um, we trust that sharing this work builds knowledge, confidence and determination across the sector. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Thank you, George. Thank you, Esme. Thank you, Irit. Great presentation. And um, it is the responsibility of universal museums to consider repatriation and decolonization of collections. And, um, but I think it is great that you've committed to transparency of the repatriation process. And I think it surely presents um, a good model, a great model for university, universal museums. Mm -hmm. um, well, may I ask uh, uh, maybe one or two questions? Mm -hmm. uh, very simple. Um, I think somewhere, you, um, Esme, you told me that you have like 30,000 objects mm -hmm. in um, the, um, this collection um, the, uh, the, from Australia. Is, am I right? Yes, right. right. Yeah. Okay. And um, in this project, um, you are you have returned forty three secret mm. yeah. um, sacred and ceremonial objects, right? Um, do you have like a list of um, of continuing, you know, um, returns that is it going to be a sustainable sort of um, process? Well, it's it's very interesting we we spoke a lot over the process as you might imagine with mm. colleagues at AAPSIS and um, AAPSIS has this really powerful compelling vision which is what it wants to do is it wants to of course support cultural revitalization but it also wants to increase awareness around mm. the world of indigenous okay. cultures so um, actually they um, they were particularly interested and I'd identified these 43 
of uh, particular significance within those communities. Um, there may indeed be a process where others are identified, mm -hmm. but essentially what they were most interested in doing is building a relationship with us so yeah. that when we display those collections okay. more widely in the future, we will have those indigenous perspectives at the heart yes. of our displays. So there may be future repatriations, okay. but actually at this stage, there are none in the pipeline, as it were. And the interest is more around how they help us to really develop um, uh, engagement with the collections that we, yes. we hold. Yeah. Can, yes, can, I yes. add, can I add to this? Um, the, the process that IATIS was doing, uh, after they, they scoped all over the world in collections, they only, they went back to communities mm -hmm. in country and they only, they only requested objects which they could absolutely match up with communities and with groups and that the groups wanted so they had to IATIS had to go to these groups and talk to them about it and they had to say yes we want them and a, a very crucial part of IATIS's vision is that there's no point in objects going to Melbourne to the National Museum and sitting there if they're not going back to country back to their originating groups sure. they may as well sit in Manchester so I think I think that's that's an important part of it in in terms of repatriation. Sure. Yes. Uh, thank you, Irit. Thank you, Esme. Wow. Um, so, um, how how much more time do I have? Um, I don't know, but um, maybe another question: What was the most difficult part in this project? It might be uh, difficult. It might not be a very good um, question, but um, was it the communication or the understanding part? Or I I remember that you've mentioned there was more gain than loss, right? Mm. Through this um, project. So what was the difficulty? I would like to ask. Uh, it's, I think it's a great question, um, uh, I, I, and I think we might all have slightly different answers. Um, I suppose very often in my role, um, lots of the conversations about repatriation happen behind closed doors. Um, and um, I, I actually think there's lots of people who don't, um, if you haven't necessarily been involved in that process, um, I, I think people are very fearful about it. So what most people would expect me to answer to your question is the most difficult part was getting board approval or was um, uh, engaging my university in that process. Um, I'll, I'll be honest, that really wasn't the most difficult part. In fact, the university really understood the significance right. of this work. It feels very strongly it is um, encouraging the next generation of global citizens um, and actually wants to support academic freedom and courage in our work. So the board at the university unanimously approved this. So actually that wasn't the most difficult part. Um, probably in a way the most difficult part um, for me was actually, um, I don't think we did a very good job at engaging other museums with the fact we were doing this. Mm. And um, uh, I, I think I was very, very nervous. I'd be on the naughty step um, uh, among other museum directors. Um, mm. And actually on reflection now, I, 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 I would, if I were doing it again, I would work harder with my peers actually to engage them because I think there's huge support within the museum sector for this work um, particularly among curators and um, and actually increasingly I think among conservators as well um, uh, I, I think actually I, I, I wish I had connected more and had more in-depth conversations and, and that transparency maybe done that more with other museum directors. Wow. I think you've done a great job and it is always difficult to be the first one to do this kind of project. We understand, Esme. 
Well, interestingly, the, the person who really helped support me um, was Tristram Besterman, who um, uh, many years ago was director of Manchester Museum. Oh. And so actually I rang Tristram and asked him because back in 2003, he was the first to repatriate human remains. Um, and so actually he was really wonderful support for me through this process. Mm. Okay, so it's taken um, a long time. There's a long history behind this, I think. Mm. Congratulations, mm. I think. Mm. Yes, and to, to your team and to the university. And yes, you can now share all this knowledge this, mm. with the students, right? The future generations, mm. they will learn. Yeah, and, and it is and, worth yes. noting the, the level of public support um, mm. support from students was phenomenal um, uh, and um, uh, I think slightly took us by surprise just that level of support um, and, and yes. certainly as we move forwards uh, engaging with the student body with researchers both in Manchester and all mm. over the world is um, first and foremost it's, it's absolutely going to be critical so well, I think it's important to say that um, the in a way, I'm, I don't want to belittle the work that's been done because it was really serious, thoughtful, reflective work, but the hard bit comes next. Um, mm -hmm. It's the kind of keeping on the path and finding how to integrate Indigenous perspectives into our work across the piece and systemically mm -hmm. as opposed to in a moment. So I think that's sort of, um, from my point of view, that's that's it's like I've been handed the baton and that you really feel okay. feel the pressure not to drop the baton and to keep moving okay. yes yeah exactly I think, great yeah I think for me the the challenge was making that shift I mean it's, it is a gradual thing and it's something that's certainly been happening in museum and in conservation um, and and I'm really accepting this and you know kind of sitting on your hands and not thinking <gasps> But, um, I th and that, I think that was, that was probably the most challenging thing, but it, it's a good challenge. And, um, and I should say, Esme, don't feel so badly because both Gillian and I have given talks to our professional bodies about this project. So we're, we're advertising it out there. <laughs> Brilliant, it's a collective endeavor. All the best things are. <laughs> great, great team and you are definitely overcoming these challenges and you'll be continuing with this good practice, I think. Yes. Thank you very much for a wonderful presentation. Um, should I give this back to um, Marta? To I'm very touched by your words, first-hand words. Also, the video that you presented and the project, I think every, every university museum should see this and not only university museum also university collections because sometimes you have a problem because you don't have a museum so this creates you know um difficulty it challenges how do you respect codes of ethics and so on and who's responsible and so on so it's uh, it's really um very important we have a project uh, regardless of whether you win or not the umac award this year okay we have a project that uh, is sponsored by ICOM, the International Council of Museums, to examine the difficulties and challenges of universities, I would say, put it broadly, universities, decolonization, okay? Mm -hmm. So, mm -hmm. and um, Steph Scholten, mm -hmm. the director of the Hunterian East chair of that project, and I would immediately invite you mm -hmm. to be part of that discussion that we will have in order to, you know, give some guidance to university, mostly university administrators, yeah. but also, of course, colleagues, uh, pro, uh, museum professionals. It's very, very important, the work you did, and um, that you have the support of the university. That I think that's very important. The support of the students, the support of your oh. colleagues in the different specialities. And so this is a very moving um, testimony of uh, something that's difficult but we have to do it we have to confront our difficult past mm -hmm. in a in the most frank honest uh transparent way as you did and i think this is really important and uh, a reference 
So thank you so much. Thank you, Akiko, for- Thank you. And um, I hope to see you next week with the last of the UMAC Award nominees. And uh, this time it will come from Estonia. We will see. Thank you so much. Hey, brilliant. Thank you. Thank you.